happy Friday. Seeing some familiar names and faces. So I'm assuming we look relatively familiar to you as well. Um, but for those of you that this might be your first time uh, jumping on uh, one of our facilities roundtables, I'll do some quick introductions. Um, again, encourage you to use the chat box. We'll, we might call on people um, every so often, so not trying to give anybody apprehension about that. Um, but we'll be monitoring that. And again, if we don't call on you or if you've got a question or feel free to just share what your respective institution or department is doing in that chat box for other attendees to review. So uh, my name is Jess Gentry. I'm an associate director at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm, I'm also joined by Amy Lanham, who's a senior associate director at Nebraska-Lincoln, and Aaron Wells, who's an associate director at Texas Austin. So um, it's been not quite a month, I think maybe just four weeks, since May is a little longer days-wise, um, since our we last had our uh, round table. So um, I know a lot of stuff has changed in my world, but some stuff hasn't changed at all. So um, assuming everyone's kind of all over the spectrum with regard to that, but um, you know, kind of jumping off there, you know, just checking in to see where's everybody at, you know, already reopened, you know, reopening next week, you know, not reopened yet. Um, you know, are there different phases that your department's using and has defined? I know I was telling Aaron and Amy, um, before things got started that they're light years ahead of where we are um, kind of thing. So you know, no wrong answers, just, you know, someone feel free to jump in and kind of share where they're at and any challenges they're experiencing with that and um, what resources they're still trying to figure out and such. Well, I can start with the University of Texas. We have some soft, soft, soft dates. We're looking at some time at maybe at the end of July for reopening facility. And we are going to do a phased opening. We have a phase one, a phase 1.5, a phase two, and a phase three. So phase one is just um, an outdoor space and an indoor parts of our um, flagship Gregory Gym, parts of that. And then as demand, as uh, the governor opens up that we can open more spaces and open more um, to allow more people in, we will move to 1.5, which is adding on facilities, adding on spaces, um, adding numbers allowed in. Phase two is kind of what we're thinking when uh, students are back on campus. And then phase three is everything's go but to the new normal. Yeah, so looking through the chat right now, it seems like there's a lot of no open dates yet, but um, these are recorded and the chat's part of that. So if you do want to put that in and you see a school that is opening or has information, you could connect with them. Um, at Nebraska, we're doing a phased approach as well. Some of our outdoor sites will be opening up June 1. And then we will have some of our inside um, spaces with limited hours and limited offerings starting on June 15. So for those, you know, obviously, like uh, Amy mentioned, there's a lot of people that are where we are at, at U of I as far as no open date has been uh, set yet. And uh, we've gotten very little, whatever you, whether you want to call it guidance, expectations, guidelines, um, whatever, as far as what that can even, when that would be, what it's supposed to look like, um, those kinds of things. So for, you know, those of us that are kind of living in this ambiguity, what are the types of things that you're working on right now, you know, trying to balance being mindful of, you know, the time and resources we put into these initiatives, um, but also trying to still somewhat keep the wheels moving, knowing at some point we'll reopen and we'll need to be ready for that. So what are, like I said, some specific projects or things that, you know, any of any of you all are working on at your institutions to prepare for that reopening? Uh, this is Anthony with the uh, University of Central Arkansas. Um, you know, we, we didn't, we had about a month of a heads up of when we're going to be opening. But before that, um, you know, trying to get PPE, 
because we knew that was going to probably be a major uh, requirement. So that's probably some of the hardest parts is that. Uh, someone had asked in the chat, which I think is a good question. And, you know, are your facilities, institutions, departments, you know, opening in line with whatever um, standards there are for your local public gyms, or is that not being viewed as a factor for whatever reason? Hey guys, this is Ross with the University of Texas at Austin. Um, as Aaron mentioned in the chat, we're not uh, going by local gyms. We're going from the guidance of university leadership. However, uh, we have been working hard for the last month or so sourcing and um, supplying uh, PPE supply chains. We have a bunch of spreadsheets and formulas set up to know how much days of supplies we have on hand of things like cleaning solutions, uh, gloves, disposable masks. Um, we have ordered some plexiglass and we're making um, protective barriers at our uh, front facing location. So anywhere there's gonna be interaction with participants um, so we're going to do a mix of freestanding and surface mounted plexiglass. Um, and so all of those supplies are coming in. And our goal is to keep a supply of at least uh, 60 days worth of PPE on hand. And so we're also working with campus partners like uh, University Housing and, and Dining uh, because we found that their supply chains through like U.S. food for uh, rubber gloves, you can get them at a substantial lower price point than if we're just sourcing things on our own. Anyone else have anything to add to that effect? So uh, Aaron and Amy touched on a little bit of what some of their phases are, but um, is, would anyone be willing to share if they've gotten to this part of their plan yet, um, what their different phases might look like uh, for their institutions and you know, kind of how you landed on those. If it was throwing darts at a wall, then that's fine too. Um, but just talk about some of the phases that you've got or you have maybe have even talked about but haven't you know formally decided on yet. So once again, Anthony from Central Arkansas, I'll break the seal on that. Um, the good news is, I'd say is that the, the Department of Health um, helped us out with a lot of stuff because they, pro they provided a lot of guidelines that we had to go by. So we are uh, scanning, screening, people before they in, even enter our building. Um, our weight room and our cardio room are the only two areas that we will have open during the first phase. While you are actively exercising, you have to maintain um, 12 feet. And then if you are not actively exercising, you're maybe like going to the bathroom or doing something like that. You have to wear your mask when you come into the building. All employees have to wear masks. Uh, and then phase two, which will be July 5th, we're going to open up our swimming pool uh, and you can only have one person per lane. I know that part of our phasing, we're basing it on square footage per person. So phase one is going to be 200 square feet for, for that one person. And then we slowly lower that back down to 150 to 100. Um, so we've done uh, one of our coworkers, Travis, has done a ton of calculations on each space and so how many people can be in each space and what that will look like. Um, we've also, because we've done the 200 square feet and not basing it on our life saving capacity of like 25%. Um, because of the equipment that's in the facility and, and things like that. Um, so we're using the square footage percentage, not like we can have 100 people in there. Um, because of life saving and then taking 25% of that. Where are, you know, pools generally seem to be in a, in a later phase, you know, depending on how many phases you have. I, I, I haven't seen a lot of places where the pool um, is in that initial phase. Um, but where, where are people at with, you know, opening the locker rooms? Um, and such, I know we talked about this a little bit last time, but you know, feel free to share again what you shared previously or if something's changed or you've got information to share. Um, I know that's been a, a pretty frequent topic of discussion as, as we have looked at um, 
where that fits. Is it an initial piece? Is it you know, phase two or three or whatever? So where are people at with their locker rooms? So the Department of Health initially came out with their first uh, directive where they said um, no to locker rooms because um, people would, they would think that people would go in and want to shower, right? You go to a gym, you work out, you want to shower. But then uh, I think a lot of facilities uh, kind of got a lot of kickback to the governor and, and the director for the Department of Health. And they came back and said, yes, you can do the locker rooms, but they're only for using the restroom changing or storing uh, your clothes or items, and then of course, you know, washing your hands. Anyone else like to share where they're at with locker rooms? Thanks, Anthony. Locker rooms, as of right now in Texas, the governor is not allowing them to be open. So that's where we are. And until that piece, we are allowing the use of the toilets and the sinks um, but the, the rest of the locker room will be off limits. Um, that's just because it's part of the, of the local ordinance. And I, I'm probably pretty sure that that's going to happen to a lot of people is whether or not the government, local ordinance is allowing it. Right. Um, so backtracking a little bit to some of, you know, what, however we're setting capacities, like Aaron mentioned, they're doing it by square footage. Um, how, you know, I'm assuming a lot of us would typically rely on our student employees to assist us with this, but um, what kind of systems are we setting up to either help educate our members um, and users or, you know, what, what does our staffing look like to help um, enforce those capacities or are we having other groups of individuals, professional staff, um, whomever else helping enforce those, you know, whether it's social distancing, wearing a mask, if you're supposed to be wearing a mask, things of that nature. Where's everybody at with any of those things? This is Pat from Syracuse University. We've, um, we've already made plans to shift mo most of our students that were working at the front desk at admissions and equipment uh, checkout to move other places in the facility and then have staff not only shore up those locations, professional staff shore up those locations, but also work throughout the facility quite a bit more than we normally would have in order to give that extra support for students. Somewhat controlling traffic flow, but also thinking about the distancing and things. Anyone else with thoughts on how we would help enforce whatever expectations are going to be upon us when our space is open? This is Scott with the University of Nebraska. We we are kind of in the same boat as Syracuse with the idea that we won't have as many, we won't be checking out equipment, we won't be doing towel service. We're just basically repurposing those folks to be kind of rovers, move through the facility, making sure that people are cleaning their equipment, wearing masks, if that's the case we have, once we get that handed down from us from above, as well as just making sure that we're practicing social distancing, no one-on-one -on -one basketball, those type of things as they maneuver through the building on a rotating basis. Thanks, Scott. Um, I did want to recall really quickly, so Mike V had asked about different HVAC standards um, and how we're ensuring that those systems are being checked and cleared for, you know, making sure they're circulating air. Um, as efficiently as they're supposed to because, you know, I think all the research that a lot of us, I'm sure, have seen talks about how vital that piece is to continue to clear um, the air of anything that, that may be lingering there. So Amy um, did put uh, some info about an excerpt from a document that was published about guidance for building operations. So, uh, and she just dropped the link in the chat box. So um, if you're wanting that info, then there's a resource um, in the chat box for that. Um, so, you know, we may have already kind of touched on this a little bit, but, um, you know, whether we've, you know, you've reopened in the midst of it, still trying to figure out what that's going to look like. Um, I think we can very easily rattle off the challenges we expect to see. Um, but has anyone encountered anything that's just like, I just did not expect that to be a challenge or that really caught us off guard as far as, you know, having to spend time addressing that more than we thought um we would if there were university expectations that were presenting a challenge for you just 
some things that popped up for as much as we anticipate that we're not going to know what we know. If there's some stuff that came up that we're just shocked that this is what we're having to deal with. Um, anyone have anything like that that maybe the group could help crowdsource some problem solving for? So it looked like Joey had a question about communal fanny packs. Hey, okay. Joey, I just FYI, we're yep. going more of like at, um, first aid stations. So they'll grab stuff from it. So it's not, we're not going to have the fanny pack on the person. So we'll have the first aid station within the room that it's in. Does that make sense? And then there'll be go bags for like really big emergencies is the other thing that we're having. At Colorado State with the fanny packs as well, we're, um, we are using communal fanny packs. We're gonna do a disinfectant on them and we've purchased enough to do kind of three rotations of fanny packs. So our opening staff, midday and afternoon staff, as those opening staff member fanny packs wouldn't be used again until that evening. So we'll have enough sit time with our disinfectant. So that's how we're going around that as well. Stephanie, how many people do you have on staff, Stephanie, to do one per person? Um, we will have 40. Okay. Of, of those of us that are uh, CPR trained. Got it. I'm including full-time staff. Yeah, and kind of in the same vein, uh, Chris Wormy asked, uh, is anyone considering, you know, leaving cleaning of the machines just to staff? Basically, or, you know, trust, not trusting our users that they're going to do a thorough job as we need to. And then someone had commented, um, still encouraging people to clean their machines, but also, you know, having staff be not long behind them once they get off to clean it. So um, any, any of you put any thought? into that and what different standards you, you might have when you reopen or if you've already reopened? At, um, at Colorado State, again, with that, we're encouraging our patrons to clean our equipment, um, but we're increasing our floor staff that will be following up pretty cl close behind our patrons to do a full clean of the equipment. We're also gonna have a green and red card on Velcro on each piece that signals if that machine's being cleaned or if it's out of use. Um, with the hopes of training patrons to turn that card to red once they're done on the piece. Um, and then our floor staff will be looking, our, we're gonna, our marketing will go out that our floor staff are the only people who will turn the piece back to green. So we're doing a full sweep before those pieces go back into rotation. How many people are you gonna have on the floor staff? Great question. <laughs> um, so right now um, we, we're spacing out our cardio equipment pretty extensively um, and utilizing basketball court space for that. So um, we're gonna put a staff member on our main fitness floor, one in our new cardio space on our gym floor, um, and then uh, two on our second floor, um, which would be about a double of our normal staff coverage. Um, but, um, that's kind of where our department's going as far as the focus on cleaning is that we're willing to increase our floor staff. So we'll have, we'll have five total floor staff on an hour. So I also want to throw out uh, one thing that we are also doing, we are waiting for it to come in. Um, the, the fogger, sprayer, mister, whatever that is, um, obviously I'm not the one buying it and I can tell you more about it. But it's uh, one of those machines that you can walk around and it will spray a fine uh, mist or layer on everything. And we are talking about doing that uh, every day at closing. Yeah, the University of Texas at Austin has also bought a combination of things. We've bought in two of the Clorox 360 electrostatic machines that are back ordered uh, and expected to arrive in Austin, hopefully sometime mid-June to early July. Fingers crossed and knocking on everything that I can. Uh, but we've also bought uh, some handheld units that are made by, oh, one second, I'm looking that information up right now. They are made by Victory. Um, they make a handheld portable unit and a backpack sprayer. So the handheld unit is like a, a quart size that you drop a tablet into. 
And the backpack sprayer is a uh, two and a half gallon backpack sprayer that also uses the same tablets. So it's one product, one tablet product, uh, but two different types of dispersion and it's all electrostatic. So you spray a mist into the area and it's supposed to grip onto any surface. So we intend to use that on our cardio equipment, our free weights, so your plates and your dumbbells. Also, when we get back into rental equipment, we'll spray it on there too. Uh, that will be done nightly on top of our um, staff cleaning through the spaces with a, a disinfectant solution. So I know the hydrostatic cleaners are very, very hard to come by. And if you've come by them, then it's very hard to come by the tablets and the um, solutions needed to maintain them. There are some other um, misters and other things out there on the market. So I would highly encourage people if they've not visited with their procurement departments to potentially have that conversation or if you work with central facilities to have that conversation. Um, because I think people are getting a little defeated with the, hey, this is backward for you know two to three months or what that looks like. Um, they may have some other suggestions for you. So um, that may be an option for you too if you just think that'd be wonderful but you don't have access to one. So TJ touched on uh, what they're doing at Colorado State as far as like the red and green cards. Uh, Max asked if anyone was, else was doing something similar or slightly different as far as denoting different pieces um, of equipment that can be used at a certain point in time. All right, the red and green cards it is, Max. We just made a decision for you. <laughs> Yeah, we're not we're not doing a system like that. We're gonna okay. rely, rely heavily on patrons to clean up after themselves and our staff to continuously be cleaning. So, kind of with that in mind, I can say one of the things that we've debated, um, I guess, at Illinois right now is um, obviously trying to mark every other machine or every third machine as much as we can, but also in order to try and make it easier on whatever staff we have trying to enforce the policies, relocating equipment, um, just so we're not you know, fighting with that member that I always use this treadmill and I don't care that it's closed and I'm gonna use it um, kind of thing. Has anyone else kind of looked at what that could look like in their facilities as far as you know, taking advantage of whether it's gym space or large multi-purpose space that we might have to move to spread equipment out more so than just marking every other piece or every third piece is off limits at points throughout the day. We discussed moving uh, equipments to the basketball court. Um, you know, we have an outer layer or, you know, concourse kind of a concept that's concrete. Um, we said we might do that if it gets to that point. But um, the one thing we, we kind of like put out there, don't forget, do not put the heavy equipment on your wooden floors unless you have some kind of a layer to set down. Yeah, we, we thought uh, that quickly came to our minds too, that at some point things will reopen and go back to normal. We didn't want to destroy our basketball courts just to, <laughs> then we're creating another problem for us. We will, yeah. we will stay strong. Our team is fighting really hard a nice pick me up um tom the tucci mentioned a, a little bit back um how is everyone working to strike a balance between whether it's policies and procedures and how we market those and then it just not being overly exhaustive to the point that it's challenging for our staff to enforce them or it's just too much for the members that even want to do what they can to abide by them to follow them um how, how are people, like I said, striking that balance and what's deemed, you know, absolutely necessary and what maybe what have you decided, you know, we're, we're not going to prioritize this as much, um, again, to try and minimize how much, how many different expectations we have out there for our staff and our users. We're in, at Syracuse, we're in a little bit of a weird spot because we just opened this year. So we don't really have like a, a specific gym culture where patrons know their expectations walking in. Um, it was a very different facility before the construction. So um, we're, I think we're planning on relying heavily on staff and then 
as that starts to continue to educate patrons as they come and try to build that culture up. Um, but it's we're really uncertain about how that's going to work out with expecting people to clean the machines themselves versus having the staff have to do it on their own. I think right now we're just viewing that when patrons do it, it'll be a bonus. Um, that's my understanding, at least. That was a, a talk a lot throughout our planning is that's a great plan, but how do you operationalize that? How do you police that? How do you monitor that? And then um, when you rethink that, is there another way to do this to keep it simple, but yet still protect individuals? Um, I think some of that was in our CDC guidelines too of looking at those to see what it's really saying about indoor space, your air quality, how long you stay in that location with those same people um, and to take all those into consideration because trying to do with the what can you do versus what you can't do and to change that environment. Um, one other thing that we're putting together um, that our local YMCA did, so we're kind of stealing from them, is a promotional video of, hey, this is what your center looked like back in March. This is what it's going to look like when you come see us in June. And so they have an idea that they're not coming back to what they walked away from on March 22nd. Um, because that's been a really hard for us is to say, we don't look the same anymore. Now you need to know what, what you're going to come into. So. So I, I think Amy definitely hit a, a good point. Um, don't get caught in the weeds and try to make up rules and policies and think chicken little if it's not there. Hopefully, you know, the university, your health clinic, the Department of Health, somebody like that or the CDC has what you need in writing. And it's literally like writing your paper, you know, reference that. Reference, reference, reference some greater being, you know, entity to help you with that. Don't let somebody, you know, get you chicken littled on, on stuff. So there's been a lot of conversation in the chat box um, the last few minutes uh, just about uh, if people are just using first come first serve on capacity, if there's certain hours for certain sets of your members, if you're doing kind of an online, online sign up system um, or something of that nature for workout slots. So um, it seems like there's a lot of a lot of institutions are looking at a lot of different things. So you know, if anyone is willing to share um, what they're doing and the top and the thought process that went behind that, I think that would be great for for everybody to hear. I'm gonna start calling on you. Jess, this is Scott from Nebraska. I'll speak to this because we're kind of in that planning phase for a couple weeks out now. We're going to do reservation based for our strength training conditioning areas based because it is more of an enclosed area and we can police it a little bit more and it's a little bit different. It's harder for us to, the reason we did that is it is harder for us to, you know, mandate what pieces of, what you, of equipment you can use and still keep it social distancing. So we're going to allow uh, whatever the mandate from the state is, how many can be in that area at six foot apart. And then our students will be kind of watching over that. We're, we're planning on having 50 minute sessions that start at the top of the hour and then leave about 10 minutes for us to clear everybody out, clean the equipment, then the next session will start. As far as the cardio equipment that's spread out through the building, uh, we basically have created social distancing by taking things offline. So we didn't feel like it was a major need to have reservations on that pieces. Um, we're still in the up in the air about racquetball courts and badminton and all those other things that probably make sense for us to do as a doubles or singles only. Uh, but we haven't really tackled that quite yet. Uh, so Scott uh, or anyone else that is doing an online sign up system uh, or whatever you want to call it, what uh, are you using just kind of an internal web tools form that, you know, your university has, is there something, um, you know, online, like through the internet or, or different organizations that have what you're using, what are you using to produce those sign up opportunities? We did a lot of research with that. We won't, we were going to use like a Microsoft Teams form and we were going to look, we looked at Connect2, but really we didn't have the capability of stopping those once we hit our limit. Uh, we, what we're going to use is RecTrack and I'm sure you could use Fusion if, there, if there's Fusion people out there. We're just doing it as like an activity sign up in different sections per hour. 
and then we can have wait lists if we want to have wait lists and, and we'll just print those rosters off and take them down to the front those doors or we'll use iPads to uh, have people check in type situation. It was a system we already had in place so it wasn't reinventing the wheel and I know that IM Leagues is also an opportunity. They, they have come out with some opportunities for IM League schools if you want to use that for uh, reservations of spaces as well. Yeah, the yeah University a few of Texas. people have mentioned IM Leagues, Fusion, RecTrack in the, in the chat box. I'm sorry I interrupted someone. No, Jess, I, I, sorry for that. Uh, the University of Texas, our um, software is all internal, but it's the same system that we're using if you were to make a racquetball court reservation through us. So we're, our IT team is actually editing that code, um, and that will be our how people can make reservations to, to get their workouts in is um, uh, just going through that. So ours is not IM-based or RecTrack or Fusion, but it's all in, it's the same premise. Yeah, I would imagine that if you have any kind of reservation-based system for different rooms that you might have to be creative, but if that was something you wanted to do, then you could probably find some functionality for that. Uh, just real quick, again, for reservations, Tom's asked, you know, are those taken by phone or email or both? Um, you know, just concerns about, about the people that say they've tried to call that they didn't get through or if we, you know, our staff mistakenly wrote down the wrong thing or those kinds of things. So it sounds like a lot of stuff might be primarily online, but um, if anyone is doing anything over the phone, also recognizing the internet isn't always as widely used by pockets of our population, um, or is it able to be accessed by, by certain pockets as well. So is anyone accepting anything over the phone or is it just gonna be all online? Jen, this is Scott again. We, uh, we will predominantly push people to the web portal piece to sign up on their own. But we, they, we do have, since it is a, our internal recreation-based software, we will have the capabilities of having the front desk member services staff sign people up if there are spaces available, just like we would register them for a camp or reserve the golf simulator, something like that. It'll be a service we'll provide since, like you said, not everyone is is tech savvy at times with the clientele we deal with. So uh, we want to make sure that we have those available to them at that point in time. So uh, shifting gears a little bit and looking toward, you know, towards the fall. Um, again, I really, you know, we're probably all in different spots as far as I know. Um, you're seeing a trickle of announcements as far as what different institutions are doing in the fall for um, academics and such so that'll impact what what our services and programs and such look like but um, as we try to plan for the fall you know what's everyone looking at for staff trainings you know even just hiring knowing that we've graduated some students may not even feel comfortable returning what we need them to do is is going to look drastically different than what they left from um and if you know you are an institution that has announced there's a plan to end the semester early like around thanksgiving or your fall break um what what does that look like um for your operation as well so again just looking a little forward as much as we can even as silly as it may seem to do that at this point um what are some conversations you've had about the fall and how that how our operations could could work within that Well, I can talk a little bit about like what we're planning right now for for our hopeful comeback um, towards the end of July. And we're going to do we are going to obviously do training um, differently. And since we're only opening two of our facilities that leaves two other teams that don't have a place to work, but we we need all these students. So there's going to have to be some crossover training between facilities that we're going to have to do. So we've kind of split this up into three different sections. We're gonna do some sort of Zoom virtual training and I, I'll be overseeing that. And that's gonna include like talking about um, social distancing, cough etiquette, um, putting on gloves, taking on off gloves, masks, um, things like that. 
And then we'll pivot to more of like an in-person training where we walk through a facility and learn um, about the facility. And then I'll let Ross talk about this, the last part. He's gonna work on the cross training piece about bringing in students from other facilities to work our facility that we're gonna have. Yeah, as Aaron mentioned, uh, Rec Sports oversees eight facilities at the University of Texas at Austin. And at this time, we're opening like one and a half of them um somewhere in that area so we've got uh a handful of student employees from other facilities that are going to be looking for some hours but also um understanding that the small percentage of teammates that we have sticking around in the summer may not be able to cover everything so we are doing some crossover trainings um, so that everyone knows how to work in every facility and the ins and outs of those facilities and the unique challenges that each facility presents we're also working on a new electronic uh, online job application for student employees so that we know in the fall that we may have to bolster some numbers and replenish some staff members who've decided that they don't feel comfortable coming back or have graduated. Um, we can do a lot of our hiring and training remotely uh, with the exception of like that final round of things where you have to do some hands-on training, the facility walkthroughs. We'll do a lot of it remotely and then the hands-on portions of it um, as it arises in the fall. So we, I did get a, a private question about program students. And yes, we at, at, um, we're gonna start out with our facility students and um, just get them trained. And because this is gonna take us quite some time to roll this training out. So we're just gonna, we're gonna start with our facility training, facility students. And then as, as we move into phase 1.52, we'll be rolling in the programming students as well. Uh, so shifting a little bit from staff to I'm assuming uh, this was more a question towards full time staff, but um, Mike uh, had asked about if you have full time staff and by all means, Mike, if I'm misquoting, please let me know. Um, if you have full time staff that feel uncomfortable with working either because they identify as um, a more vulnerable population uh, or, you know, they, they live with someone or have to routinely interact with someone that's a vulnerable population. Um, this could be more HR focused, and I think Mike mentioned that, but um, Amy shared some info as far as what Nebraska um, is doing to approach these situations, but anything else that how you, how we helped uh, to manage and support the staff that we have that are largely comfortable, you know, returning to the office uh, just yet. So I, I will say that our, our HR department um, put out guidance, and I think that's probably the best way to look at it is go and look at your HR on um, if you are in that high risk category, you know, how your uh, boss can work with you from that standpoint. But at the same time, they also put out a statement that when we come back full time, uh, you know, on campus, that fear or thinking you might catch it is not an excuse not to come to work. And I think that kind of stung some people on that. Yeah, I'd agree. I think, uh, I can't remember who made the comment earlier, but it's one of those things where, and it might have been you, Anthony, as much as you can reference other departments or groups that have, have shared whatever standards we're trying to enforce that, uh, that helps. I know for us, of at Illinois. So we haven't, we're starting to transition our full time staff back to work starting the week of June 8th. So um, a little over a week from now. And we created a schedule that's, uh, we have a pretty large administrative suite. Um, and most of our staff are in their own offices. So that helps us as far as keeping distance and having your own space right now. So we created a schedule that it's orange and blue um, and kind of split the staff up evenly in each group um, and kind of alternated offices. So, you know, the individuals that are on either side of my office, you know, I'm in the blue group. So they're both in the orange group um, kind of thing. And I think someone else mentioned something somewhat similar and Aaron was talking about before I jumped on the call that Texas um, is doing something uh, similar. And as far as, you know, our university HR, they've also made similar statements as far as encouraging departments to work with individuals that 
you know, have some concerns about, you know, being high risk, like I said, you know, living with an individual that's high risk and how we can best accommodate that. And uh, they haven't made a firm statement yet as far as things in the fall. Um, I, I think they've kind of made a statement like, you know, the expectation is you do the best you can to accommodate things, but um, they haven't like kind of put their foot down with anything yet. And at least over the summer, they've again asked departments to be flexible um, with individuals who may have had childcare uh, that fell through for them. So our university is being pretty flexible, at least for the summer, but I'd agree, Anthony, at some point that's either going to have to run out or, you know, it's going to run out and then we're going to have to figure out how to manage those pieces as well. Is anyone else, you know, whatever plans they have for rotating or bringing their full, full-time full staff back to work? I was sharing with Jess and Aaron before the call too, that our new phrase on our campus is called de-densification. And so we have a very similar um, directive that all those that can continue to remo work remotely should do so, um, even continuing into the fall semester. And then um, what we've been looking at is scheduling our staff in pods, teams, um, and only having one third of the workforce present or within proximity of each other as we do um, our schedules. And then same thing, students subbing into those shifts would come from that pod. So you don't have that cross contamination. So it is it is a lot of extra work and it's a lot of extra focus to see kind of how those pods are constructed or what that looks like. But then again, if you have a positive case in pod one, you know that pod two and three can keep coming back to work and um, you're not stuck with an open building and only two staff that can come be in that weight room with you. So. So I, I, I know I kind of joked with Jess about not hijacking this and Amy hit the perfect thing the pod concept and i'm not trying to tinfoil hat this but you got to also think about this with your workers what are they doing when they leave where are they going who are they interacting with who are your co-workers interacting with because you know the moment that somebody pops hot as we would say they're going to say contact trace where you were and the moment that your facility gets linked to somebody that popped hot what do you think is going to happen to your facility So yeah, we hadn't quite gotten to that yet, but um, again, one of the other prompts that we had talked about, you know, on the call is what, you know, what's, what guidelines have you either developed as a department or your university or local health officials have shared as far as the process if um, someone does test positive um, once we begin to reopen. So I'm gonna kind of go back a little bit of a way for that tracking thing by um, so we have to check our not only ours but our student workers um, by mandate by the Department of Health temperature when they come to work our clinic has to do the same thing and they actually um, have it where they have a group meet group text and they have to group text what their temperature was and then also say that they didn't um, they met the criteria to come to work by the Department of Health. And that's kind of a way we keep it and track it. David, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you just put in the comment phase along with your phases and then, you know, HR wanting to track who and when people are on campus um, and such? Could you just elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so our campus has a four phase plan for returning, starting with um, like research and some other um, areas. And then I think we're coming back like part of phase three and more like re more probably reopening our facilities in phase four of that plan. Um, but they've also told us that when we do come back um, right now, we're at a stay at home order in L.A. So nobody we're not even allowed on campus. We don't have access to our facilities at all right now. Um, so when we do get to kind of phase back, then they're going to want to track who's on campus, what buildings we're going to on campus, because we have multiple facilities. So that if I think the main goal of that is if somebody does end up with um, contracting the virus, then they'll be able to track where that person's been, what days they were on campus, what hours, who they may have come into contact with during that time. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyone else with as it relates to what plans either have been shared with them from their institution or what they've been talking about as far as 
whether if a student on campus tests positive, if someone on your staff tests positive. Sorry, I was starting typing and then I just, I'll just pop on. Can we just go back to the temperature thing? I'm really having, I don't know if anyone else is having a problem with this, but the fact that we are using this temperature standard when there are so many ways that it's not consistent, if you are in any kind of desert atmosphere, if you are a menopausal woman, you rank high. Um, and people have been, <laughs> it's true, and people have been uh, doing temperatures outside and the thermometer gets hot and then it reads wrong and they're giving false positives, so to speak. Um, and then people taking acetaminophen and, and ibuprofen to lower their temperature so we're using this temperature standard and then yet on the all the other questions that we're asking do you come in contact have you come in contact have you traveled to these hot spots it's all self-report honor system but the temperature reading is somehow like this indicator and and we're gonna make them go away like is anyone else struggling with that piece or maybe it's just me i don't know I don't think it's just you, Steph, and I, I mean, I can say I, I would agree with everything you said as far as the self-reporting, most of it, I don't know if it's the, the thought process is it's something we can easily check, so we're going to kind of thing. That doesn't make it right. Uh, I, again, I struggle just with whether it's the FERPA piece of it, like, you know, just sharing the info out to other people, like what is fair for us um, to do. I know as a department, we've already decided that if campus dictates that to us and is going to provide assistance in doing so, then, you know, that's, I mean, we'll do what we're told to do, but as a department, that's not something that we're going to push for actively being done. Again, we'll have the signage about, you know, if you have a fever, if you have the dry cough, you know, all the other things that come up. But I don't, like I said, as a department, we've decided we aren't going to actively push for the temperature checks. If we're told that someone's going to be doing that for us, then, you know, that is what it is. But I, I mean, I would largely agree with everything you said. So I, I guess I kind of opened up Pandora's box with staff. I, and I do, let, me, let me also state that the temperature checks mandated by the Department of Health are for us in our facility. And then they also mandate it for the clinic. That is not for every person out there. And I saw somebody scrolling through Chris, the asymptomatic. 100%, you got it. That is, we asked about testing everybody temperature-wise, and our head doctor at the clinic used that right there. He said, you're going to miss a lot of people with it asymptomatic. Why do it? Well, I think that goes back again to what we, you know, we reiterated several times is that we started out very much so that direction at Nebraska, and yes, we were going to do that, and how we were going to get our hands on them, and what was that going to procedure look like, and you know, what, what would happen if someone couldn't come into the facility? And then um, with guidance from the med center, we, we moved away from that. But then we've still been working with our local county health and human services department um, in regards to what that looks like differently at our child care facility on campus, because it is still within the guidance and the regulations for that age group. So, you know, I, I think, again, you, you have to be very, very cognizant of your region, your area, use your local county health department, use the CDC, um, use your medical professionals, resources, all of those things, because as much as you can cite the source and where that came from for the decision that you make, I think that's what would help with some of the question earlier about you know, are you having too many policies, too many procedures for a liability standpoint? Um, I think it's important for you to document where you're sourcing that information and why you're making that choice. So, you know, kind of a, a segue from that, uh, and I think we've talked about marketing indirectly quite a bit, uh, but we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so what is your marketing look like where the, whether that signage around your facility what you're putting on your website again sourcing um you know the the different the different uh whether it's the cdc the nih the local health department whatever to help you know provide those sources that it's just not us pulling pulling things out of thin air because we feel like that's what we want to do uh, but what does your marketing look like are you having to develop that internally is your institution providing it 
Um, what are you, you know, I think Amy mentioned, I wrote down the idea of um, the promo video of what you're coming back to. Any, said anything in that marketing realm that you all are doing or have talked about doing that um, could help, you know, what, what it is that we're going to be walking back into whenever that is. I know it's not the marketing round table. <laughs> so I waited for the three second pregnant pause, as they would say. Um, one, don't go out and recreate the wheel. Go to your Department of Health, go to CDC website, okay? They have stuff out there that literally tells you all those things, you know, this, the six feet, the wash your hands, the symptoms, those, those kinds of things. So if you're trying to recreate a product, don't do it. Go out there and look for it. It's available. Um, we are basically going to put stuff up everywhere in our building. Um, obviously, all the social media platforms, the website. Um, somebody had asked, well, you know, how much are you going to put up there? I said, if you can swing a cat, you can hit it. Well, we at Nebraska have our university communications and our student affairs marketing where we're getting our marketing collaterals and using the same thing. So if you see the sign in the union, you see the sign in the rec center, you see the sign in housing. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to NURSA because they have um, some great graphic images that they created. So if you don't have a robust um, marketing department or access to that, yes, you can pull from the CDC and other places. But I know that was part of the NURSA know with some collaterals that they had too. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd say we're similar at Illinois that we have some marketing in house, but it's also through student affairs as well. And so there's a lot being created that we either just have to print off and which I'm glad it'll be consistent. Um, I think as much as we can do that for our, our users and students, that's going to be helpful. Anything what's um, How are how is everyone putting this information on their perspective websites i know i think you know we've all kind of adapted over the last few months about how we share covid related information or what we're doing virtually or things of that nature um but how are people looking to share some of this either on their websites or social media or, or those kinds of things All right, well, hopefully we start to develop these things and then we're able to provide resources um, to each other, you know, if we have another round table. Um, someone did ask um, about disinfecting and utilizing bleach. Rob from UTSA, do you want to uh, provide the specifics around that? I've, I've lost the chat message. Yeah, hello, everyone. Yeah, we're we've uh, are considering using a bleach solution as as a seat on um, some of the CDC content. Uh, it states that it only requires a one minute content time or contact time. I'm sorry. Uh, however, when you go look at individual products, uh, like you know, Clorox or what have you, on the e EPA's uh, list of uh, products that that are uh, effective against uh, SARS. Um, you know, they state various contact times. Um, so kind of confused there on what recommendations to follow, whether the CD, it's the CDC's one minute or action, actually using uh, the, the manufacturer's recommendations on how long uh, that specific bleach product should sit. Um, I, I, is anyone else using bleach or you're planning on using a bleach solution to disinfect and um, what recommendations are, are you going to follow? Uh, Mike here with Lowland University. Um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of research on the disinfectant also, and the, the Clorox did come across uh, one thing we're looking at. The area that we keep finding challenges is in with what county is more than likely going to require us to do cdc said we have to do and then we run into the problem that our machines are actually able to handle um the equipment machines you're not supposed to use any type of alcohol solution period on your equipment but then cdc says that you need at least a 70 percent solution in order to kill and disinfect your equipment and so we run into this catch-22 area of what do we do and what do we not do um 
Right now, we're kind of staying away from bleach in a sense, uh, due to mostly the the uh, the aroma of it and the pe person having to cling with it. If we're trying to do a one hour or two hour turnaround time uh, with a deep clean, is the room now going to be sustainable to come back into for users and use the equipment within the smell and everything? So we're kind of stuck in that limbo area as well. And we're trying to get more um, understanding of what we should do. What we actually did though was reached out to our chemistry labs here on campus. And there's a potential that they're actually going to create solutions for us on campus and distribute it to the areas needed on campus versus us going outside and uh, purchasing the material. So. That is actually being worked on currently. Um, another area that we've explored, and if you've been watching the news and everything, it's becoming more and more popular, is UVC lights. And using lights in areas to help kill uh, germs, viruses, bacteria, and all that, and stop the growth of it. And so right now, we're pursuing uh, different companies that we may be able to utilize on uh, equipment, uh, use of equipment, or even checkout equipment that we can uh, use that on. So that's where we're at with it. So it doesn't sound like many people are either using bleach or considering using bleach. Thanks, guys. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, a couple other questions. I'll try to get to them. Someone. Uh, asked about so I, I've heard people mention through their answers about um, having visitors or you know maybe not explicitly saying when you're working out you don't have to wear a mask but we've listed people having to wear a mask that aren't necessarily working out are there any institutions that are going to require individuals working out to wear a mask while they're in the midst of that activity I know um, at Illinois. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Mike, again, um, th that question has been asked several times with us as to what we're going to do. I have been very outspoken on not having our members while exercising use masks uh, due to the simple fact that um, we've had it in the past where people try to use those off the market VO2 masks and they end up passing out. And we're gonna have more problems in our facility with people passing out versus the actual coronavirus that we're in right now. And so I have been very outspoken with it and there has been a lot of uh, good push behind me and, and the reason for it to not have participants while exercising use masks. If they're traveling through the facility um, to and from restaurants, whatever, yes, masks must be worn, but while exercising, no mask use. Yeah, there's a lot of people putting comments in about what they're either waiting to hear or, you know, kind of where they're at in the chat box. Uh, one quick last question while we got one more minute. Um, someone had asked about if anyone's requiring people to fill out any waivers or questionnaires to document um, either the answers to those commonly common symptoms being displayed or, you know, just that's kind of their screening mechanism as people are entering the facility. Anyone doing that? Um, we aren't, but I did hear on one of these many roundtables that I thought was really good was the signage said by tapping your ID here, you are saying that you in effect have not come in contact, have not traveled to a hotspot, whatever. I thought that was a great way to do it, but it doesn't, it doesn't give us documentation. It just you know, gives us kind of an out on it. All right. That was one of our conversations student affairs wide too, was more of the social contracting of, um, and an app that they were considering using that you answer these two questions and it gives you a green circle or a red circle and just kind of encouraging that to be the new social norm that, hey, take this quick questionnaire, see what you get. And by the color of circle, yeah, you should go to class. No, you shouldn't. Yeah, you should go in the rec center. No, you shouldn't. 
But again, it goes back to that. How do you answer truthfully? Do you care to do it? But I, I definitely like the kind of social contract before you scan your ID, what you're agreeing to. So. All right. Well, we are at two o'clock, at least in Illinois. I'm sure it's different where, where each of you are, but um, our hour is up. So just want to thank you for your, your time and engagement. Um, it's always great to have so much participation on these because it makes it, I get really anxious when there's crickets. <laughs> um, so appreciate how, how willing to share um, and how engaged everyone's been on all of our roundtables. So that, that's just been great. So um, again, hope everyone's doing well and is hanging in there as best they can, whatever, you know, your respective situations are. And um, I mean, I hope you know that, you know, all of us are here for every single other one of us. And, you know, please let us know however we can continue to um, support you and, you know, help us all get through this together. And then also just rem a reminder, the recorded version, including the chat box is on nurses website. So if you miss something and want to see that, or if, you know, someone you know is unable to attend it, they can, um, they're able to view that and read through those chats as well. So have a good weekend, everyone.